thanks for coming. I see some familiar faces and some new faces in the crowd, so thank you for participating. I'm Josh Drum, Community and Economic Development Specialist for the City of Montpelier. Um, welcome to this first uh, spring engagement session here about the Country Club Road Master Plan. Um, and I just wanted to give a sort of a, a summary of what a master plan is, because uh, maybe some people don't understand what a master plan is. It is um, aspirational documents that we can use as a community based on community feedback for future development. Um, it's not a capital investment plan. It's not a zoning ordinance. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a framework and provides a, a roadmap for future analysis to achieve the vision that the community has laid out within the master plan. Uh, so that is what we're trying to accomplish here in this master planning on this site. Um, so, um, just wanted to give you guys that update um, on what we're doing here um, and introduce Stephanie Clark from White Work, uh, Real Estate Advisors with our consultant. So good to see everybody. Thanks for joining us on such the only window of nice weather we're going to have the entire weekend. Thanks for being inside with us. We will um, get outside a tiny bit at the very end if you are interested in getting out there. Um, but we really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us to get updated at the spring stage of phase one of master planning. And I'm Stephanie Clark with White & Burke, Dave Saladino from VHB, and Mike Beattie from Black River Design are also here from the consulting team. And Evelyn Prem, the communications coordinator for the city, is also joining us today. We have uh, the mayor joining us today. I think um, I saw Sal, the other, another city council, there he is. Um, so thank you all for joining. And thanks for taking the time and being interested and invested. And for the folks who are here for like the third time, I really appreciate your continued investment. And we're gonna take some time starting with the um, presentation because there's a lot to go through. We've done a lot of work in the last few months and we've done a lot of work to get to this point. So there's gonna be a, a fair bit of explanation here and I'll ask to hold questions till the end. We're gonna have a lot of time for questions as the thrust of today is not, uh, we're not planning any exercises or anything. We're just gonna um, try to explain what we've been doing and then get into Q&A and feedback um, to really get into things. So we're gonna talk about the process that we've been through. We'll talk about what we, what we heard in, in the winter sessions that we were all present to. We're gonna talk about um, the data that we brought back to the city council and how that evolved into these concept plans. There are the full size plans here to look at. We've got slides that will be of course harder to read. These are also all available online. So the concept plans themselves, um, some of the cost data is online. We're gonna be updating materials online so you have a chance to kind of get a preview now and then go check out the materials afterwards. Um, let's see, so we are, and then yes, we'll talk about cost, we'll talk about some funding scenarios and talk about what the actual master plan will look like as well as um, then take questions. So this phase one of the master plan started a year ago, really, when, we, when the city purchased the land. Then in the fall, the consultant team was hired and we started a separate new public process. A lot of you were in attendance for that. Uh, we've got, we gathered input on the site, concurrently working on the data of the site itself, due diligence on the actual property and the physical elements and natural resources. In the winter, we took um, a new opportunity to look at the plans combined with the input and talk about what's called opportunities and constraints planning to kind of see what direction the community wanted to go in relative to this idea of housing and recreation. The land was purchased for housing and recreation. That is what we are supporting here, but what balance of that was really the question for, for the winter phase. Um, in this phase, we're working on the concept plan. And the concept plan is what will be incorporated into the actionable master plan. The actionable master plan is not just a plan, it is a document that has the recommendations, has some uh, guidance, has next steps baked into it. This is not, by any means, a final land plan. There's not a developable scenario here with design or anywhere near the detail that's needed. It is a vision, and there are many factors subject to change, but if you don't have a vision, you don't have a direction, how can you, take, how can you come up with a list of next steps? So there's a lot more steps required. One thing I want to acknowledge is that 
we know that there are immediate recreation and housing needs in the community right now. So it's a balance, it's a tension between wanting to have a very inclusive and transparent and thoughtful process while also taking practical due diligence steps to keep the process moving because this is likely a 10 year project but you can't get to 10 years without taking the three month steps and the two month steps and the six month steps. So we're, we're moving forward with some urgency while still trying to remain inclusive. So where we are today, we had a meeting with city council in March to bring them up to speed on the, the findings from the winter. We have these concept plans we've released. We're having some public meetings. We've also put out a big campaign to the community for input because we recognize that you folks are here today to devote two hours to this, but not everybody can. <coughs> so there's a video online that's a short, less than 10 minute video to explain what we could in 10 minutes or less. Uh, there's the survey to take, and we've done a lot of flyering, a lot of education. But it's going to rely on people who are invested to keep talking about it, too, to get a lot of input. And we've, um, we're going to open the survey on Monday, so May 1st. How May is next week is beyond me. <laughs> so May 1st through May 12th, the survey will remain open. And then we'll close the survey, get, gather the data, gather our recommendations, and put that out to the city council for a meeting on the 24th that will decide which of these three concepts gets added to the master plan document and that gets set as kind of our course to go forward. And in June, the team will bring back the actual master plan and present that to the city council and the community, which will end phase one and continue and launch phase two with the next steps that need to happen, which there are gonna be plenty of. So what did we hear in the winter is where I wanna, wanna recap because folks who weren't here or people who were here and wanted to know what others said um, we had a ton of participation. We were really thrilled that we had a lot of people come to meetings. We had a lot of folks take the two different surveys. We had a high school survey. We had a public survey. Um, we had over 12,000 data points to collect and try to make into what needed to be included and not be included. And ultimately, unsurprisingly, in a, in a way, but what was so beautiful about it is that it was pretty clear that there is a desire for a balanced site. This is not an all rec site, it's not an all housing site. There's a balance of rec and housing on this property that will, will address the high housing need as well as the need for indoor and outdoor recreational opportunities. Everything from racket sports to swimming pools to outdoor fields to trails to fields and multi-family housing, single family housing. Across the board there was support. And the specific piece around housing is that there was a need and a desire really overwhelmingly from the community for a variety of different housing product, which we understand will hit a lot of different affordability levels. And there's only so much of that that the, that the city can control, but we've tried to address that and I'll talk about it. There was also strong support for conservation, um, balance of um, trails with, with developed spaces and impervious land. Um, incorporation of spaces for Abnaki recognition and celebration and education, gathering spaces, wildlife corridors, and connection to the surrounding parcels and transit connections to uh, other parts of town. So a lot of strong support for a lot of things, and what we are trying to do is try to see how we can accommodate that. There was strong support for energy efficiency and minimizing impact um, on the climate, and a strong support for minimizing the impact to taxpayers. Ooh. Easy. Easy, easy, easy little wish list. So our job's been, been fun. So the concept plans that we've brought forward that we'll go through try to reflect a lot of these uh, desires and a lot of the things we can control and the things we can affect, um, we can affect, we can solicit from the developers. And that a lot of what has been heard will get incorporated, if not on an actual plan, because it may not be representable, uh, but rather baked into the documents and into the recommendations, which are which is where the meat of it comes. And so there's so, some things not shown, and there's some things not shown that won't be baked into the master plan either, because there are future steps. The developer, for example, will be in control of certain aspects. Um, they will have more a handle on the market and 
the market analysis at that time, because again, if this is three years out, there may be different market demands. At the time the city partners with a developer, there's the opportunity for the city to have a conversation with the developer about that housing product. But um, that is not reflected. That level of housing affordability, we can't know at this stage. The exact housing product, the exact technologies, everything from geothermal to a tiny house design, isn't reflected here because that's going to be down the line, that's a future phase. There's things not reflected like neighborhood amenities, like um, amphitheaters and playgrounds. Those aren't included here yet. That's a little premature. That comes in future phases. We've also met with some representatives of the Abenaki community um, and have chosen with their collaboration not to represent specific locations where that would happen on this site because that needs to happen through a more collaborative process. So that will be part of our actual master plan is forming a working group with Abenaki representatives from different tribes to help figure out where the best uses of the site would be for celebration versus education versus uh, recognition and probably citywide, not just a uh, micro focus on this particular site. Uh, future plans will also refine the infrastructure detail. This is high level infrastructure detail. This is not down in the weeds on exact um, uh, engineering. We've also accommodated wildlife corridors. That was a concern that came up a few times, but they're not specifically called out. They, they naturally have been built into the flow of the design, and maybe Dave can speak a little to that. Um, and then most significantly that everyone's probably noticed and we've talked about in our materials, but we've called out this zone. It's called the Recreation and Community Zone, which is a 12-acre part of the parcel. And what has emerged is the, the need for the city to be doing a much more comprehensive and uh, immersive process <coughs> on that planning and programming. And what that means is that there's a concurrent but, but separate like a parallel process happening the, between the city, the rec department, and other rec stakeholders, and we'll be ramping up, in fact, more to, to determine what that programming should look like, both indoor and outdoor recreation. It became apparent that we don't have enough information about the exact needs or the exact desire of the community for those needs at this site right now. So let's take this as far as we can. That process will unfold, and the two will run together concurrently. So that's part of uh, phase two, and that's going to be called out as well. Okay, I've talked as much as I can for the first part. <laughs> Dave's going to go and tell us a little bit more about each of the plans. That's, that's just 12 acres? That's... Yeah, it is. And that was, that was determined, I should say, that was determined with um, help from the rec department and rec um, advisory board to determine what could be the max, what would be kind of the max or either kind of optimized area to accommodate the needs <laughs> under that. If you remember from the first, from the last round, we had three test sketches and there was a, um, a zone that kind of emerged for that that showed this kind of layout. <clears throat> it's 12 acres out of 136. For just outdoor, indoor rec, not considering trails, um, open space, etc. All right, so uh, for that introduction, uh, I do want to go through the slides. I, I realize you cannot see a lot of the detail here. Uh, hopefully we'll have time afterwards if you want some folks had a chance to look beforehand. Uh, I do want to just kind of frame the big picture uh, differences between the three different concepts. Um, before even doing that, though, just stepping back, you know, as we, as we um, started to look at this parcel in general, and, and probably not saying anything you aren't aware of, but this is a fairly unique terrace, you know, along the Minuski River. There's uh, a lot of Montpelier is very steep, right? And not a lot of uh, level uh, places in Montpelier. And so this this is a very unique site from that perspective. Obviously, the, the golf course designers recognized that and took advantage of the uh, kind of the terrace in here. So as we were laying it out, we really wanted to take advantage of the natural lay of the land and minimize, you know, earthwork and reforming the land to, to suit the, the development. We also obviously are on a hillside here, so the natural flow of water is you know, heading down towards the river. So we've got all of the streams and existing kind of culverts and waterways that are here before. So we want to play to that, kind of listen to the context of you know the, the water flows and, and the terrain. Uh, and then obviously we've got some nice views from vantage points right up here from the top of the hill, looking at, at Camel Sum. 
I also want to kind of take advantage of those things as well, really play up what the uh, amenities are on the site. So as Stephanie alluded to, we've had uh, three, three concepts, and these were developed, these were refined from the winter uh, uh, stage where we had three different concepts. At that time, we were looking at a range of, uh, we had uh, maximum housing from one end to maximum recreation, so that the idea of the winter was to look at that range. We took the, the input and have developed these three. And so the, the, the kind of the main variable across these three is the number of housing units. And so the one we're looking at here, concept A, has the most number of units. So here we're at 200, you can't see here, 294 total units. And so the, um, <clears throat> just to kind of walk you through the overall, because most of these kind of follow that general, the same general main access roads you can see here. We're, we're sitting right here under this green area in this, in this building. Um, and so as you arrive in this concept A, we've got this first cluster uh, of multifamily housing. This is seen as, as five story, uh, so one story parking underneath and then four stories of residential, kind of clustered around a community green, maybe a community garden uh, area. Uh, coming back here, these orange are multifamily. They could be duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, again, depending on the, uh, the market at the time. Um, we see here as a potential gathering spot for community uses, playground, and other, other um, amenities here. Uh, and then <clears throat> I do want to note, it's, it's a, well, you can see the, the purple line here, this is the proposed U32 trail. Uh, but then a little bit harder to see here, these dash lines, we do have a network of trails that both connect to the U32 trail and then down here to the trail along the, um, uh, along the river. Um, so I do uh, also want to note on here, you can see uh, a little bit here, the green, the green, I just want to note the green trees that are noted are the existing trees out here. We didn't take the extra step of, of showing additional landscaping, but did want to show that we're taking advantage of the existing um, you know, mature trees and don't want to, uh, to affect those. So those are all noted here as the green, uh, green circles. Um, also just to note, in all three, uh, about 80% of the property in total is preserved as natural, uh, uh, natural space. So we're really just talking about 20% roughly of the parcel for uh, any of these concepts. <laughs> so um, this is got to be, it looks similar from the overall kind of spine road alignment. Um, this one has a similar uh, high density five story buildings here, right uh, just you know, out beyond the parking lot here. Uh, we've got our, our multifamily units here, the community gathering space here. The big difference here is that we have a cluster of single family homes out here. So these could be smaller homes, um, tiny homes if you wanted to go that direction, or just kind of typical stiff uh, single family homes. Uh, and then concept C, uh, stepping down, so this is 184 units total. Um, and so this is a slightly different concept here. As we arrive, this is a five-story C-shaped building. These are two three-story buildings, so a little bit uh, differential in height, a little bit less density right at the entrance, still keeping the, the community garden, potentially in this area, community gathering space. Uh, and then we have the, uh, the, the um, uh, multifamily units here. This cluster here is uh, retained in this for natural uses, for trails, and um, uh, outdoor, uh, outdoor uses. So I think that uh, in total covers kind of the, the range. So again, we're going from most dense, most number of units down to the least number of units. But close to 300 to just under 200. Yes, thanks. And we will have, obviously, more time for questions on this and digs around for that. Um, you know, the test sketch when we met in the winter was for this balanced housing approach. So we stayed within kind of a range of the type of density that was that was supported throughout that winter process, which is this range that we're talking about here. Um, and again, all of this is subject to change that the actionable master plan is a living document, as Josh said. It, you know, it may evolve and the housing needs may change within the next three years in a way that uh, a developer could come in and propose something that's really creative that stays within, again, a plan kind of sets out a vision that the community has and then when you find these partners who can bring innovative ideas in, maybe there's a way to do a higher density still uh, minimizing impact and so we want to leave the door open for that. We're going to talk a little bit about cost, <laughs> and we're going to talk a little bit about financing um, because it's important at this point. Um, there's a lot of numbers, and we will be putting the materials on the website, um, but I don't, I, and so I, they're also small to read. I'm sorry about that. It's just the nature of presenting. Um, I also don't want anyone getting too hung up on numbers because you get really, um, I get really focused on a number, and then it's in my head, but 
truthfully, this is very high level. This is an order of magnitude. We've got the entire um, you know, scope of our work, phase one work, was to come up with high level order of magnitude for folks to start um, uh, putting that together. Yes? Forgive me for interrupting, but could you stand to the oh, left sure. of that chair? Thank you. Yes, I can. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, so I do think you know the, the important part here is to understand scale and theory of, of how you get this built and how the city could go forward in the process of the development of these units and what kind of partnership opportunities there are, what kind of funding opportunities there are. There's a lot more due diligence to be done. So we are intentionally doing this at this point in time to because it's hard to conceptualize this without numbers, right? Quantitatively is, is important, but you have to balance that with the fact that it's so early. One thing that um, I will mention, it's April now, and by the time we present this to council, we will have new uh, debt numbers that we could use, new interest rates we could use. Um, we are continuing to refine estimates. So the numbers that get presented to council in May, that get put into the actual master plan, may differ even from what we have here. But in terms of order of magnitude and differential between the three concepts, that's not going to change. So let's start with cost, and then we'll talk about how it might get funded. Infrastructure cost here is based on the city's perspective. That's really important because this assumes that the city is going to actually, this is a very conservative estimate, the city is going to build all the infrastructure. That a developer would do their own individual buildings and driveways, but they wouldn't build the, all of the streets that you see here, would be built by the city. And that's a conservative estimate. That may change. You may do a partnership with a developer who's willing to put in for that. We may require, as part of the RFP, that they put in um, purchase their parcel for a, per, a, per, a certain amount. We haven't assumed that here. We're doing really conservative numbers. And this is what the city would be investing in order to catalyze the vision we want. Keep in mind, a lot of what we've talked about for the last six or eight months here has been housing is incredibly difficult to build right now. It's not because we have just hundreds of selfish developers. <laughs> like, there, it's just, in, that's why we're in a housing crisis. The numbers just aren't making sense right now. It's really hard to build housing. So the, the incentive is the whole point of economic development. How can we, the city, roll out a plan that makes it desirable and achievable and feasible to do the type of housing we want? So this assumes the city doing um, the, the, the infrastructure, it does not look at the community and rec zone, as we talked about, that's going to have to follow a separate process. There will be another number that comes out, but we'll talk a little bit about that more. So these are high level estimates. Um, On-site infrastructure, those, those two numbers represent what's within the city, li the parcel limits here. Um, it includes some things that are listed here, it excludes others right now, those numbers continue to evolve. We also look at the one that says the new signal or roundabout, which is technically an off-site improvement, but has to do particularly to these concepts. With the first two, A and B, the quantity of units would trigger the need for a development of a roundabout or a signal, but the C would not. So we show that as the differentiation between the three, and that's important as you try to wrap your head around, do I want A, B, or C? And then the remaining costs, offset costs and sunk costs, those are actually all the same for all three concepts because we're at a level, consistent level with all three plans that would require this amount of investment by the city. Starting with the pump station and offsite water sewer upgrades just to get the water up to the site at 1.5 million. The purchase price of the property doesn't change whether or not we do 180 units or 250 units. It's a three, it was a $3 million purchase price, so that's already been bonded for and invested from the recreation fund, but it's important we included it because it's already being, um, it's when we want to think about, we want to think about the whole cost. And then due diligence, there's uh, consultant fees. By the time you get through more of the engineering, you're looking at usually, it could be even more than a half million, but to start with, that's the kind of due diligence cost you're going to look at regardless of which scenario. So roughly if we say 19 million for A and B, they're the same. Because you can see, as Dave explained, the two concepts have the same road infrastructure, water and sewer infrastructure, and C is where you see a difference um, with 15, around 15 million for 
the fewer units. So um, we're going to talk a bit, I'm going to come back to costs in, in a few slides, but I want to take a moment to talk about how this hypothetically could be funded or financed. Um, this is not, a, this actually wasn't part of the scope of phase one that city council gave us because there is so much speculation, there's so much hypothetical, but as the process has evolved, it kind of feels like half the story to talk about the cost without how you could possibly fund it. Um, so we're going to talk about some, some possibilities here and focus on a few sources and give you an illustration of how this might work and how it would affect your tax rate. Because as you talk to your friends and neighbors and constituents, that's going to be a question. How much is this going to cost me? And I understand that. So um, these are some hypotheticals. For example, um, we know a million from the Recreation Reserve Fund has already been invested here for the purchase price. That's a source. And we know there are grants available. How much grant funding, we don't know because in two years it could look very different. There's a lot of ARPA money out there right now that may not be available in two years, probably won't be. Um, but there may be new sources. Then there's also the developer piece I mentioned. If the developer were to contribute, we don't know what that looks like exactly, but, we've, but we acknowledge it could be a source. And then there's TIF, which is tax increment financing, which I will explain a lot more in a moment. Um, but there's different ways to do a TIF. The municipality can do one itself and just choose to finance through their own tax revenue, or you can go through a state program. And if you were, if you're qualified and you're eligible, have a state TIF, or TIF designation, which would allow for more funding. And then there's water and sewer user fees that, based on the quantity of units, could help fund the debt service here. So lots of different ways we could structure this. Um, we have not you know, done all of them. Uh, but we've done a couple to try to illustrate how this could work. So bear with me. I know there could be a lot of questions on this. There's a lot of numbers. Um, but this is thinking theoretically. So concept A, we said the, the, the total cost there was about 18.8 for the first two concepts, 15 for concept C. If that's the total infrastructure cost, then we've already got a million in from the REC fund, and then let's assume about 1.5 million, that could be Northern Borders Regional Planning, uh, Regional Commission grants, it could be trail grants, um, uh, congressional uh, earmarks, you know, we don't know exactly, but let's make a, an assumption. This, these are the numbers to look at, the remaining to be funded. How could we fund 16.3 or 12.8 million, depending on the concept? And two, two possibilities are TIF, municipal only, or state. So let me explain what a TIF district is. The city of Montpelier had a TIF district. You might be aware it was a TIF district in the downtown, um, downtown TIF district. It has since been dissolved, but that doesn't mean that the city couldn't come back for another one. But how TIF works at the state level is that, well, it's actually at both levels, the city invests in the infrastructure, and takes out a municipal bond. The taxes, as the residual new taxes, anything new built after that point, go to pay down that debt service. So it's a nice loop that helps fund the actual investment that has helped make the project work. There's a key phrase here called but for, which is but for the city making this investment, the development wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't pencil, it wasn't possible before that. There's some great examples statewide. Barry's done it, St. Albans has done it, Burlington's doing it, Kellington's doing it. Um, I always say I wanted to be a ballerina when I was growing up. Somehow I became a TIF expert, but I spent my time on <laughs> a lot of infrastructure and it's been used very powerfully. It's very effective. The cool thing is that there's a state program that allows, if you go through and get a state designation, you can retain not only a portion of your municipal taxes that are generated, but a portion of the state taxes. So anything new on this site or in your district that would otherwise go to the education fund, 70% stays in your district to fund that infrastructure for 20 years. And then at the end of 20 years, all of that new revenue goes to the education fund and your general fund again. So it's the only way a city can actually invest in itself and grow itself. And again, these projects wouldn't be happening otherwise, so it's not foregoing any existing revenue stream. So that's TIF in a nutshell. I'm sure you're all super psyched about um, being experts on that now. But the difference is that you can also do a municipal TIF. So the state TIF, you have to get state designation. This municipal TIF, 
that the city could decide that all the revenue generated on this site could go to pay down the debt service for the infrastructure of this site for a period of time, for the term of the bond, let's say. And that's a really powerful you know, uh, mechanism to be able to pay down the infrastructure debt until it's you know, fully built out. So we looked at that and we said, okay, assuming, again, conservatively, that you use a flat tax rate, never seeing an increase in your taxes for 20 years, at the fiscal year 23 tax rate, you generate, based on the number of units, that many taxes for the municipality, municipal tax, and state tax, that's a large, those are large numbers over 20 years. That generates a lot of taxes. And if you could split those up uh, and use them to pay for the debt service, how much could you afford to build here based on that, on that revenue alone? So we looked at the municipal only to start. Again, remember, we said the amount to be funded um, after you take out the amount that's invested from the rec fund and the grant funding, about 6.3 million or 12.8 million per concept C, have to assume cost of financing, your interest cost, and then you take that third line here, this municipal only revenue, this is the revenue from just the taxes generated on this site municipally, and you get closer. You cover about 60% in concept C, um, and more so in concept A, to you know, to, to cover the cost of the infrastructure, just using your municipal taxes. Well, you also have water sewer fees. Sorry, this is a really busy slide. And I thought of, at 11 o'clock last night, rounding these up to whole numbers, but this is all from a model. <laughs> so these are direct from a model that I built that um, has precise numbers. So the top is what we just saw in the last slide. So if you've got this line here, that's the remainder to be funded, there's a, of that amount that you couldn't fund above, you've got to pay, this was just the, the cost of the, uh, the interest to pay what could be funded by this by the TIF money. Well, the additional cost of financing, if you take the eligible water sewer fees, which water sewer fees can only be used to fund water sewer infrastructure. They can't be used to fund the road infrastructure, for example. So eligible water sewer fees, you see the concept A, actually pencils out completely. It covers the cost of the infrastructure because you've got the most units paying the most user fees, the most taxes of the three scenarios. And then so on and so forth. You've got remainder costs that would have to be covered in another way. But you see how we can start closing the gap using just tools that the municipality has control over. Then we wanted to look at state TIF. And the moral of the story is a state tip is very powerful. <laughs> um, it has, because you're retaining 70% of what would, of the education fund piece, that's very powerful and very, um, there's a large quantity there. So you've got the remain, going back to that remaining amount, the total amount to be funded, interest cost, and then what you would get from the state TIF, which is a combination of your municipal taxes and a portion of your state taxes, then you actually have a surplus. In the case of the surplus, and actually if you added water sewer fees, you could actually even increase the surplus because you'd use those water sewer fees to pay for the water sewer infrastructure and then you'd use debt capacity with your TIF to help fund the rec component. So now we have that rec zone over here that we haven't been talking about, we, haven't, we don't know enough about yet for costs, but now you see how maybe a state TIF could help offset those costs and you're gonna see the most from concept A with the most units because it's gonna generate the most taxes, generate the most user fees. So, let me get to the takeaways so that we can go back to bigger picture and then if there's specific questions, we can come back to those slides. The, the cost update, you know, the takeaway on the cost is that A and B are pretty comparable in terms of cost, even though there's fewer units in concept B, the infrastructure requirement's the same. So that's a comparable gross cost to the city for the infrastructure. In concept C, um, you see about 20% reduction in cost because there, there's not this road system out here, there's been some changes in the infrastructure, but you also see fewer housing units. And so what that means is a quick number here, I'll read these out, but it looks like total gross cost is 47,000 per unit in concept A, 
it goes up to 51,000 per unit in concept B, because you have the same infrastructure cost but fewer units, and then it goes up even further to 56,000 per unit in concept C, because even though you have a lower overall cost, it's higher per unit because you've got, you're spreading that over, out over fewer units. Again, random community zone component is still unknown at this point. So just to put back, to circle back to that financing hypothetical and just the exercise of looking at how it could be funded, um, the city will look for grants. I mean, that's the intention is to continue to look for grants always. And there's lots of sources. We don't know what they may be yet. Um, but we know that municipal only TIF is within the city's power and using that plus water sewer fees can cover a lot, probably most of concept A, if not all of it, some of concept B, some of concept C. Um, using the state program would be even more powerful to cover the infrastructure needed for housing, maybe have some left over for recreation and community zone. We know that there's a lot more due diligence. This is only phase one. This is high level starting to get vision and direction and use and scale and massing, and that there'll be more work done in phases two and beyond to get clearer on the design, engineering, and permitting. Um, specifically, permitting could uh, uncover issues and in general any of the further work could get could increase our costs but it could also expose other funding sources too if you got creative with doing some sort of you know creative design using mass timber for example on a community facility that would get more into the rec part of things but mass timber has a lot of funding sources right now and that could be an interesting funding source so we we keep that door open in phase one and as the partnerships evolve with developers who bring innovation and resources and capital to the table and with the recreational programming, there's a lot of further work to be done, a lot more to um, discover. So what this means for right now, for phase one, here we are in the spring stage of phase one, we're closing out phase one in the next month and a half, and we know the city will continue to need to look at the costs and funding streams Ultimately, this will come back to the city for the city voters for a cost vote. This is not a cost vote right now at all. <laughs> so this is when you talk to your neighbors, especially if anybody's concerned, well, how much is this going to cost me? Right now, nothing. Like we are, the due diligence is being done. That's an economic development cost. But this is not um, a vote on A, B, or C. Is not a vote for a capital expense or a bond at all. Um, this is a focus on the vision of what you want for this site so that the due diligence can continue in phase two. That's really the important part. So the survey that comes out in on Monday is going to ask that you rank choice vote, vote on one, two, on A, B, or C. It's also gonna ask to um, have your rank, rank your support for a community and rec uh, recreation and community facility on this site. That has been a question that the REC process has come back to multiple times. They really need the data. And so to keep that process moving, we're asking that in our survey so we can keep these two things tied together moving forward. And almost lastly, <laughs> then I'll be done, is talking about the actionable master plan, what to expect in June. We will, it will encompass a lot. As I said, the plan itself is not the actionable master plan. It's one piece of it. But we um, intend to talk about you know, the process with the rec zone, hit some of the recommendations, which is to explore rezoning this property. Right now the zoning is not, so does not support these. Uh, explore rezoning, explore the growth center expansion. This is not within the growth center. This is, there is no TIF district anymore. This wasn't in the previous TIF district. So exploring that, um, working with permitting due diligence, setting up the Abnaki working group, um, addressing transit issues, starting those conversations, those partnerships that needs to happen. Could, all of this has to happen kind of concurrently in this, mit, in this mix. And then really getting into subdivision planning as those permitting conversations and design conversations advance because how do you subdivide the property to be able to put this out to an RFP eventually so that a developer can come forward and start paying taxes on those pieces. So you need to ske sketch those out the right way. So what we'd ask of you is to please go to the website, just view those concept plans, take the survey, tell your friends to take the survey and review the concept plans. There is a short video online of me as a talking head for nine minutes and it's fine. 
but it <laughs> gets the point across of some of the messages we've hit here. We weren't able to go into this level of detail, so his email is on the website, Josh's. Um, send people his way, um, easy for me to say. Just go to Josh um, with questions and comments, and he's happy to, to answer them. And I'm done for the moment. So what we're going to do is ask for Q&A, and Josh is going to kind of cue people in um, to you can speak to a question or a thought or a um, feedback for us, and I'm going to get a pen. So. Yeah. And I think if I, if I could have you say your name, um, where you live, uh, before you ask your question, and what we do first. Lynn in the wild, I live in Montpelier, and um, when, I'm wondering when the recording of this meeting goes active online, and will this slide presentation also be on the website? I have friends that are not in town right now yeah. who want to be involved in this, yeah. and they need this information. Really good question. Thank you. That was something I meant to mention. Um, Getting this online, Evelyn, when would that what most likely be available? Yeah, so uh, Orca is here um, filming for us, so as soon as they have the footage ready um, and to be loaded onto the website, I'll get that up there, um, I assume, by the end of next week at the very latest. Um, and the slide presentation will be up Monday as well. Okay. Yep, so we are going to put the slides up on Monday. Um, and Yes, please do tell your friends, and there's also two more meetings. There's a meeting Wednesday night at City Hall from 5 to 7. Um, it's also available hybrid, so you, so you can be online or in person for that meeting. And then on the 8th, which is a Monday, it's a um, all online version. So this exact presentation, two more times. So if there are people that want to clue in, cue in for that, pop on for that. Um, I also meant to mention that at the end of this, we're going to wrap close to like quarter of noon or, or 10 of, and invite you to go outside and provided it's not super rainy by that point, we were just gonna kind of orient you. Instead of doing a site walk, which is not super accessible for everybody, and we didn't know what the weather was gonna do, um, stand out and, and look at where these things are while you're on site, give a little bit of orientation, because I think it can be a little confusing if you've not been on the site before. Gentlemen in the back. Thank you. Uh, Ron Wild, also a uh, Question and a half. Uh, this, the survey is, seems to me to be A, B, and C is really about balance. Uh, my question is, what are the conclusions or assumptions to be drawn by the planners, including city, by the survey results? Because there's a lot of detail that's not there. I assume none of the above isn't an option. Where exactly the housing is is an option. It's really just about balance, recreation versus housing. So you get this survey response. What are the assumptions that you're going to draw from it moving forward? And the yeah, half question was about the recreation facility. Are we talking about an actual building versus just facilities? This is why we're opening the survey after today. Uh, we should add that <laughs> because it is the building we're talking about. When we say facility, we do mean building. So we could clarify that in the question. I think it's worthwhile um, making that clear. Um, first part of the question was conclusions and assumptions from the survey. Do you want to speak to that at all? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I think your question is getting at what are we, what are we getting from the community selecting A, B, or C, right? Uh, you know, part of the winter survey was to get a direction of what the community wants, and they, they clearly said they wanted a balance of housing and recreation, which all three of these really uh, represent. Um, so it's really just trying to get to a, a balance that the community is gravitating towards within sort of like this framework. In, including, including housing product um, is a particular question. While we can't guarantee that this is the housing product that would be developed, you know, if we adopted that one that has single family in it, in three years, if a develop, by the time we get to that parcel, that node, a developer comes forward and says, you know, I can actually do some really cool, you know, built-in housing to the hillside. It's not single family. It's got this pivot, and that's more appealing to the city at the time that may be the way it goes, but this is trying to get at um, some of the nuance between the feedback we heard 
in the winter. Specifically, these, there's one thing I wanted to mention that's not exactly an answer to your question, but the beauty of the winter process, what it came, what it came out to, and as we talked with the city council about, is that there was so much consensus that we actually got to this point. We thought we'd have more variation by this stage, actually, between the three. But there was so much consensus that it led to this style of, of variation. So now we're really into the nuance of housing product, layout, density, this here. And that is what we're going to be then focusing our action planning around and getting to those quantities. The quantities matter relative to the next due diligence steps. So if this is the favorite with the lower quantities, um, we may put into the actionable master plan some different recommendations. Yeah. Thanks, Jack McCullough. One small technical question. The, the post on the city's Facebook page said that one of the meetings this week is Thursday, May 3rd. So the day and the day don't match up. So <laughs> someone raised that with me, so well. Which so, is it? Right? Which is it, right? Yeah. We'll make that it's Wednesday, May 3rd. Wednesday, OK, great. So we will, but we will update that. Thanks, Jack. Yeah. The survey, is there a way to verify uh, residency in Montpelier on the people from the survey? Uh, well, I think this survey, you will have to register for a Polco account, uh, which is the platform that we use for all of our surveys. And so we put in our address? And so you would have, yeah, you would be registering. Uh, I think address is required. Um, so we can ask, we can, we can do it a couple ways. We could, um, at, we'll have people register to the account and ask them for that information, or we can have it register for an account and still ask a separate question of, um, you know, do you live in Montpelier or an outside uh, neighboring community? But either way, it will draw uh, demographic data, so we'll be able to, to align that with the survey results. I just would like it to be the community of Montpelier that's making the decisions. Anyway. Yeah. We haven't decided that yet. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question um, because we haven't launched the survey yet. We have another meeting Monday to do that, um, working out some of the questions we wanted to see how this, um, that might come from this meeting. Um, you know, one of the big things that's come from this process is regional support. We've, we've heard from a lot of regional groups and a lot of um, regional representatives who see the value and merit of a site this substantial. Um, the capacity of the site to support regional, one of the big recreational, outdoor recreational opportunities here is to host regional events, um, things that would bring people to Montpelier that would help Montpelier's economic development in other ways. Um, so, and there's a lot of people who, um, I think it might have been Matt who, who might have mentioned it at one point before, which is a lot of people want to live here and can't afford to and want to live in Montpelier, and this site is the legacy that could allow for people to, to increase the population and, um, and quality of life for a lot of people in Montpelier. So I'm not, I, I hear your point, and I'll, I'll make note of that, but I don't know if it's been decided if it'll be exclusive to Montpelier residents or not at this stage. Um, Stephen Seeps from Montpelier, and if there is a recreation facility here, and it would, you know, attract kids after school and so forth. Has there been consideration of a regular bus service back and forth to downtown? Um, there's been talk of it. It's definitely one of the pieces of that actual master plan is to look at transit issues and opportunities um, because it would, it would necessitate that exact question, which is not just the kids, but also um, seniors, because this would also, the facility would also have a senior component to it. Um, the senior center and transit would be a, an integral part of for any program that we would have here. So we would have to take that into consideration. It's it's part of the ongoing planning. It's also right. accessible that we've got the bike path here too. So you know, driving is one way to get here, but certainly walking or biking too would be pretty pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to follow up, Dee Dee Brush. I live in Montpelier. I just wanted to follow up on the comment about the. Montpelier residents versus when you when you um, get the results of the survey, it'd be helpful maybe to delineate x number of people who are out of out of towners and demographic x number data. Of people, right. Yeah. 
Yep, I'm making note of that now. And Evelyn said that's possible. Okay. Yep. Yeah, uh, Rob Apple, Mount Clear. Stephanie, question, why wouldn't you or shouldn't you include paying off that bond that Montpelier wrote it on as part of the uh, part of the cost? You, at the beginning, you kind of said, well, that's being carried separately. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It is included. It is, in it is yeah. So it's, it's rec I, I was saying, I must have misstated it. It's, it's on here because we've already put the money in. And so it needs to be reflected in the picture. We didn't, and so it's included in what would be bonded for, even though we already have bonded. So it would be included in the, it would be paid the revenue off stream. First. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Correct. Because we wanted to look at it comprehensively. We started by we hadn't included it, and we said, well, that's being paid for now, but it eventually could be paid for, well, no, repaid I mean, for, I mean, out of the. Most of us voted. Yeah. If we voted for or against this thing, the yeah. exception was that bond would be paid off quickly. Because now we're covering a, whatever it was, $3 million bond, $2 million bond, I guess, yeah. mm -hmm. um, yeah. for potentially a long time if right. nothing happens here. Right, right. And, and I mean, that would be true if nothing happened here. I mean, this scenario conceives that the, that the taxes would go to that bond first or you know, part of the bond package to pay that down, um, that that would be reimbursed basically, to the general fund out of these taxes. And another question for, I mentioned to Josh earlier. There was some talk about trying to incorporate this parcel into like, the city so that it could be exempt from Act 250 review. Mm -hmm. Because when you go through Act 250 on this process, this project, it's going to be potentially a big issue in a lot of ways. So if you can get this into the, into the city, downtown somehow, I don't know. I think the growth center is part of growth how we're center. gonna try to yeah. do it through that growth center designation and the growth center legislation around exemption for for, for Act 50 in a growth center <coughs> is coming. <laughs> we think. Yeah, right, you legislated. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, but duly noted, Rob, because you're right. And yeah, it'd be great <coughs> if Act But we've not assumed that. We've assumed Act 50 is gonna be required. Over here. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jeremy Beaudry. I live in Montpelier on Elm Street. Uh, my question is, with the three different concepts here, um, there's a range in terms of the housing type, the housing unit number, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about how you came to those parameters. Was it about what the site could accommodate, any kind of demographic or trend information about the housing need? Mm -hmm. I'd just like to hear more about that. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, um, some of this came out of the process in the winter. So having um, starting with what the site could support. So you, you asked that, that's, that's baseline. So what's the natural resources? Dave can talk more to this probably better than I can anyway, but the natural resources are, are a limiting, limiting factor or constraining factor that you want to accommodate. And then product was really selected and designed based on the feedback we heard around product interest. And the resounding response was not a lot of single family. Just really high density here. Look at opportunities for affordability because it's, you know, go vertical, less impervious. Um, that's reducing impact on climate and natural resources. So those were some of the considerations. You, the other, I, one other big thing we, if you recall, or were taking part, we had there was these kind of clusters of zones. We were asking to rank what you preferred in each of those zones, and what came through loud and clear is the density would step back as you go further back. So the highest density would be up in this kind of red zone, and then step down. So we tried to kind of mirror that as well. Mm -hmm. And then again, balancing it with a lot of trails, a lot of conserved space. So again, eighty percent is open space on all three plans. At least eighty percent. This one has more. Um, because of such a big uh, desire for that, but also because the, the land supports it. And if you can get this amount of density on a smaller amount of percentage of coverage, you hit some other goals. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, um, yes, I'm curious about what, where you might stand with the uh, roadway access plan, in particular, um, the railroad right away. It's just in my experience that's always been um, a real sticking point yeah. in the past. Um, so I was wondering about that. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Uh, that was the one that I that I hit on that list of actionable master plan recommendations, but it is one of them that's going to have to be one of the very next steps is to engage with um, the railroad because it is it consistently becomes a barrier with certain development projects. Um, we don't see it as being a like uh, what's the word I'm looking for like deal breaker kind of thing um, that could have halted the project. So we cleared that hurdle in terms of being able to say that's not not likely to be a deal breaker, but the conversation has to happen now that once we know density, we didn't have a density to tell them until now, so you know, maybe we'll um, have a little bit better sense after this, but in the last stage, it was anything from zero housing units to 500 housing units, and that would have made a big difference in having the conversation with, with the railroad. Um, that's one form of access. You talked about other roadway connections. That's also on the list of due diligence is to look at how, and I thought maybe Rob's question was going to get to this, but a big question that came out of the last phase was how does this connect with other parcels like Saban's Pasture, um, it, any development to happen there. The intent of the city is the integration of this within the existing planning efforts as well, um, bringing ro a road network from the West has always been an intent to get that over to Savings Pasture and then eventually now over here. So that's on the list. You can see it's this is one that we've shown two potential connectors. We don't know which way will be feasible uh, financially, physically, or legally <laughs> with the conversations and negotiations. But eventually, with this level of density, you probably want two forms of egress. Um, and access. So there's other types of connections that are also going to have to be explored in phase two. Um, yes. So what's are there limitations on state graded TIFs? Please say the name. Oh, I'm sorry, Barbara Conry. Um, are there limitations on state TIFs? Um, I understand yeah. in the past you have to apply for them. Yeah. What's the likelihood that Montpelier would get one? Hmm being recorded. Okay, um, so <laughs> we are, um, no, this is a, it's, you're absolutely right, Barbara, this is a, uh, the state program requires a designation, requires a, a huge application process. There's a limit to the number of TIF districts that are allowed per county and a total limit on the number of TIFs per state, in the whole state. So the, um, the likelihood is hard to predict, but Montpelier has gotten one before and showed good due diligence, showed good planning, and closing the TIF district is also a prudent move. I mean, the district was approved in 2017, and then there was a pandemic, <laughs> um, or 2017, 2018, and then there was a pandemic, which halted so much of the development that could have happened. So there was a lot of reason to say, we're not gonna make it. There are certain windows you have to do debt with um, TIF district, the five-year window we weren't gonna hit. So it showed a lot of prudent administration, and the state has been very respectful of that and very appreciative. So. Um, we would work to get that designation, but I would say it's far from being a guarantee. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of steps to doing it, and a lot of uh, criteria that need to be hit, including being part of a growth center. Um, so getting that growth center designation is required before you can get the growth center designation. You have to have the right zoning. So it's all these these con um, consecutive steps. Does it make sense to start that process now? I mean, even if before the plans are finalized and all that, shouldn't you be going after the growth center, going after the TIF designation so you know you've got it? Because I think the concern I know I have as a Montpelier resident, I don't want to take on another bond issue or 13 or $18 million. We can't do it. The city is taxed to the limit now. So, so we can't. Can you do that? We can't go for TIF until we have a growth center. And we can't really go for a growth center until we have some sort of vision for the property. But I would say the answer is yes, now. Like as in following the spring phase one completion, start that rezoning. Because now we know there's gonna be housing here. We know there's gonna be dense housing here. We didn't know that in the winter because it could have gone either way. Um, now that we know that, start that. Then once you have, but the, they're all the requirements. So the growth center, they without a plan, you can't do a growth, you can start to do growth center, but TIF you can't do until you have a plan and you have, that has to be much further baked. But the other piece is that we wouldn't go for a bond until we know the financing mechanism. <laughs> so you're not gonna do the TIF, the TIF bond. You can't do a TIF bond without knowing the plan and the project. You can't, you can't do it. Uh, TIF district is 
Um, there's different TIFs across the country, and they some of them have historically and tragically failed because they do the if you build it, they will come model, and they would run a water sewer line out to their interstate interchange in you know the Midwest, hoping that a Walmart or a Lowe's would come, and then it never did, and they're stuck with the bill. Vermont does not allow that on any level. <laughs> you can imagine there's like zero support for that model completely. You have to have a development agreement in place. You have to have your financing very clearly locked and loaded. Um, and that's why they've been so successful in the state. Um, my question, it sounds like in the voting between the concepts, part of what we're voting for is kind of this total unit number. Um, and my question is, like, as things move forward, um, is are there any constraints to the density? So, say if a developer were to say, "Yes, I'm interested in in this piece of it," but but found that they needed more density or a higher unit count to make it doable, right. um, are there any kind of like limits where it's like, if we get to 400 units, then that pushes us into you know some other category and how much leeway would the developer have in terms of that design it's a really good question um a really good question it's like you work in this field um yeah so uh a lot of that is to be determined by city council by a future process so when the rfp goes out there needs to have a very clear process of how the decisions are going to be made and we don't know that right now um, it's a real tough balance of trying to make sure that we're respecting the int original intent and integrity of a plan like this while still leaving the door open to evolving needs of a community that, you know, the state, the, the levels of housing um, may change in terms of demand. And then also evolving in innovation and, you know, possible innovation that could yield better results and hit. So one of the things that's baked into the uh, actual master plan are the goals qualitative goals like minimizing impact on climate, minimizing impact to taxpayers. Can that be achieved with higher density? That may need to be a consideration and be left open to hit those goals. So there's different ways of getting there and I think we're going to try to build that framework as well as we can in 2023, but also reserve the right that the council at the time and whatever working group is doing the RFP review um, has some ability, and then ultimately it goes to a vote, you know, with the, with the municipality voters voting yay or nay on the infrastructure, and if you see that the volume of, of um, density of the housing is way higher than what was wanted, but it's going to bring down those numbers and it's going to make it free <laughs> to the taxpayer um, and achieve these other goals, that's where the proof will be tested out. And some of them also get wrapped into the zoning, right? How, how does it end up getting sure. zoned? Are sure, there's going to be limits built into zoning. Yeah, that's a good point. Right. I'll go back here. Remember to state your name, please. Sarah Brock, East Montpelier. Um, my family owns land uh, north of that that is um, developable, I guess, I think. And um, I have uh, a pretty good idea that it's going to be for sale um, in the not too distant future. And um, so I'm interested, we're all interested in the vehicular connection, and I can't figure out from the map what land that connects to. Do you know? Well, this parcel in particular, Josh, do you know which parcel this is? I don't, I don't know. I can't remember, but that. we did meet with um, I, I know. the abutters. Yeah. yeah. It's to the left of that field in the middle. See the mountain to your right, That's further, right? No, that field to the left of that, yeah. to uh, <laughs> where the property line is. So this, this is the property line here? Yeah, yep, yeah. yeah, it's up above. To the left of that line that you just drew. Yeah. Right down to your your line, the golf course line. Do you want to come up? <laughs> 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 this area here, right? Yeah, she's, you've got a rope in hers the last time. Yeah, she's right, right here. This That's hers. Yeah. It's right there. See this line when golf course comes up? Oh, yeah, yeah. So she borders that and then a little over to here. Straight to this stream right here. That's Sarah's land? No, it's not no. mine. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. I, that's her my relatives. Her family's land. They're interested. I'm sorry, I meant I, that's what I meant. Family, yeah. 
And we met with some folks from yeah, the well, well, yeah, we had a conversation. So you don't know whose land that is that it goes to? Um, I can figure it out. Never we, mind. Yeah, we figured it out at one point. I mean, these are these are completely conceptual because there could be right. We as we said, this is like you know, it could possibly go this way. It could go over and then over. It very much depends. This was illustrative only to show that we need to provide them. The one, the one you have drawn going north, uh, yeah. roughly, it goes to the what was it, the Dales property. Or so okay. Ones, I don't that, know. Okay. So that's to the west of you, sir. Is Sorry. that is that definite where it will be or Oh no 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 yeah this all conceptual all illustrative just hypothetical showing how we need to it says potential future vehicular connection location TBD because it's showing that we need to accommodate some other access but that's going to require conversations with butters it's going to look at the natural resources uh -huh. the feasibility seems to be the only one that I see on the map. At the moment. There's two. There's two? Oh, there's two? Okay. Yes. There's one to say that it's over in this direction and one more. Oh, okay. Over the gorge. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Inevitably a bridge of some sort. Yeah. Or go north of the ravine. <laughs> bridge. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve Cease. I live on North Street. I'm not the same guy as that Steve Cease over there. Um, I, I would just like to say that I think that um, I personally would have a very hard time responding to the survey at this point in the absence of any real hard engineering. We have really no idea of the technical feasibility of these pods of development. At the meetings and whatever it was earlier this winter, you heard people asking for slope analysis to see what the slopes are like for topographical limitations and for other engineering details. The western pod in particular is very steep, and I just can't respond without knowing whether anything out there is anything more than just a, a nice picture at this point. Thanks. Um, over here. I, yeah. I just want to follow up with Sarah's question, I think. I don't know if the right place, but the, the access to her property um, probably wouldn't be feasible for an access to this property. But my question would be, um, could the abutting landowners tie into the, the infrastructure that's going in, the, the road, what road access and water and sewer? Sir, can you identify yourself, please? I'll um, build a port in Montpelier. I, I have the property to the east of Sarah's. Yeah, that absolutely, Bill, is, is one of the considerations. It would be one of the desires of the city is to see everything integrated. Um, you know, in order, that's one of the best practices in planning to really integrate your infrastructure, make it so that you increase users, you know, over all over the entire network. Um, and it does increase the potential, the development well, potential of other properties um, in that area. But yes, we know that these are not precise locations of access and that there would be a lot of challenges to get to, because it's not shown on the map, but you know, they have the road network that comes in here um, and challenges from physical feasibility as well as legal and about you know trying to come up with the right way and all of that. So there's not a clear solution, but you know, showing it on a plan with like, you know, about ten arrows going in ten different directions didn't seem like the answer either. So for right now it's it's really a next step. And just to get back to Steve's point, I just I want to say that um, we understand that the engineering is a big piece of the next phase, and it has to be. Um, but again, we can't get to that level of engineering in a phase one of a master plan. It's just not feasible. It's not prudent. It's not what typically is done in master planning at this point. Um, getting a vote on A, B, or C allows us to proceed with those next steps, proceed with the next level of analysis to start doing more of the design, which truthfully may alter what's feasible, and we know that, um, but that's why it's a living document, that's why you advance concept plans. It's very different than private development. If you've ever done any private development, you have a vision for what you want to build, you go in, you do the analysis of the site, you see how it, but, it, but in that way it's not much different because then you respond to what the site can and can't do and what the permitting can and can't allow, and that's what we're doing. It's just a much bigger process because it's a public process and we have to be transparent and keep releasing iterations of things that in a private development process happen actually a lot more rapidly. 
calling the goal on failure. Oh, maybe I missed this, but when you were um, doing your financial projections, were you assuming that the city would put in the infrastructure and then basically make it available or, or give the site to the developer um, and that there wouldn't be any kind of cost per unit coming from the developer? Yeah, it's a good question. I think what I was saying is that um, we have, a, from this, what the numbers represent is the city's, is an assumption that the city has done everything. And yes, there's no contribution from the developer. That's a very conservative, because we're trying to show what the highest end of this might look like. Um, because economic development wise, what communities do often these days, especially in the last five years, we've seen this in a major uptick, is what can the city do? What's within the city's capacity <coughs> to make housing more feasible, or the housing you want to see more feasible? So what can we put in what's prudent for the city to put in that's city owned, instead of just giving a stipend to a developer of a, of a pure handout of money, but rather city owned infrastructure and asset that would then act as a catalyst for the, for the, for the property you want, the development you want to see. So in this scenario, yes, it shows all city investment. But in reality, who knows? We might want to ask them to pay for the property. We may you know, have a purchase price baked in. We may do an impact fee. Um, we may, they may opt to want to build their own infrastructure. And that's OK, too. You know, that might be, it's kind of going to have to be a negotiation depending on the developer and the development plan. Peter. Um, Peter Gellman, Montpelier. Uh, first, I just want to thank Stephanie and the baby <laughs> for, uh, for being here. I think your contribution to this uh, process has been fantastic. Um, and I think the, the opening comments that you made are really important, putting into context where this kind of community discussion fits in the beginning of the process because it's a public, we own property. It's not a private development. That's a very important distinction that I think needs to be better understood <laughs> across the community. Even to here today, we hear questions that sound like people aren't quite getting that point. That's the reason why we're here today and not out there breaking ground like we could be if it was a private development. But just a couple of points of clarification. What happened to the 500 plus um, model of buildings out there? I know some people are going to be definitely asking that. Number two, I think when you are explaining the difference between here and saying you were looking for some direction in, in answer to the question back there, the, the choice between some of these actually relates to your cost estimates mm -hmm. because, because it's very clear the concept C with the fewest houses is the least expensive. I'm sorry, it's yeah. the most expensive per unit. Per unit, okay. yeah. per, It's the most expensive per unit. Yeah. So if your priority is, ha is building housing, then it's kind of a choice between A and B. I think people need to be clear. That's what you're looking for here. You're not looking at something that requires engineering. You're not looking at something that requires a deeper uh, uh, due diligence. That will come once you are clear about which of these concepts you want to choose, and I hope people, when they fill out the, with the, fill out the um, a form, the, the, will, will be clear about that. I think it, we haven't been broadly clear about what this process is. And I just have one other question, which is, I know people are concerned about five stories, and I think you ought to say something about that and, and check with the fire department that they've got hook and ladders that can uh, do it. But um, I mean, but, but if, if, if we're looking for density and density brings down cost and density creates more housing, then that's the reason for five stories. And we have to say, well, why not five stories? If, if people really are allergic to them or what? Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Peter. I mean, part of the idea to cite five stories down here is elevation purposes so that you do get, you know, minimize the visual impact versus up on the, um, the, the dense, the slope and the terrace up there so that it doesn't have quite the same <coughs> height and scale. Um, did you want to say anything more about that? No, that's good. Okay. Um, and what happened to 500 units is, is a very good question and it, it, um, it has come up already in fact, but that is really a 
uh, result of the winter process. I mean, we wanted to make, we wanted to put it to the voters and the, the residents, and from feedback in individual meetings, feedback in um, stakeholder meetings, and from the survey, it came back pretty resounding to keep it under that number. That highest number was not was not highly supported um, because it didn't allow for the the range and, and scale of the recreation. So we have to be responsive to that. Um, and again, I think you're, to your point, these show how you can get at certain densities for a certain price point, generally. Jody Pedersen. I'm concerned once we get the engineering um, studies that how are we going to find out from the public what they want to do if we can't do those houses up there? I don't want to still say, oh yeah, but we still have to have all these fields down here. Um, right. When, if this became the major place where we could put housing, does the community want that instead? Right. That, you know, right. It's, it's one of those, yeah. if, if this happens, what do you want? It's so iterative, that's exactly what you're getting at, which is, you know, because it's a public process, you know, how, how do we come back and talk about it differently? Um, do, do you have a comment? No, it is, a, it is an iterative process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, this allows us, this is the vision to work towards, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, and so we are going to uncover different things as the process unfolds. Um, and so it, and we just, we, we learn and we adjust from those new moments. And, and most likely, I mean, you could build houses pretty much, you know, as, as Rob knows, going up at, at, at Spruce Peak, we've got houses on cliffs, right? right. It, it just, it costs more money, right? You may have to engineer the foundation. Or, so it, it may just add costs, but I, I don't think there's any question you could get some housing out here. And I should say, I mean, I don't know what the city, uh, my contract is through phase one, so I'm not going to speak for the city beyond phase one, but, you know, there are circumstances where it may require another public, you know, input session of some sort, even if it's another survey to talk about some various options. Um, it's not going to be an endless public process because eventually it's just, let's put the, put the, um, the price out there. Like he said, you know, this was the vision, this is the price, and if that gets, turned down or, you know, we haven't been able to fund it, because that's the other thing. If it goes up, the cost goes up for it, um, there might be other ways to fund it. So let's just see if we can fund that vision, though, still, and push as hard as we can on that. And then, if it ultimately were to fall completely apart, there's always an opportunity to come back to do more public process if needed. Oh, just also, there's really importance to getting this master plan done, is because this is what's used to then talk to funders mm -hmm. about this is what the community has said that they wanted from this huge process and we need some more pre-development money will you help us and they will be really open to that because they they'll see the process that we've had with the community and they'll know okay the community's bought into this yeah maybe we can open you up for a half million dollars or a quarter million dollars for just for engineering so this helps us get to that next level of analysis sure, and open the funding sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gentleman in the back. Uh, Ron Wild again. Procedural question. What's the the how and the when? So let's say we have a three, four, five story building near the entrance. Privately owned condos, mix, it's rental, the city runs it, downstreet runs it. Where, where in the process do those decisions get made? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that that will come down in, in the next phase when we start talking with developers and, and um, talking with our partners. Uh, we know that we need a certain level of affordability, um, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then it comes down also, as Stephanie pointed out, the time of when construction is happening, what the market is willing and, and, and able to, to do at that at that moment. Um, so, you know, it's, it, we can't predict it now. Um, we can work towards achieving <coughs> affordability at a certain level, but there might be that some of these multifamilies are rental. They could be condos. It just it doesn't ma it matters 
at the time, um, but we can't predict. So what's the who, how, and when? Yeah, the process. So uh, in the actual master plan, one of our recommendations is going to be to, in the near future, could be summer, could be maybe fall, but start conversations with specific types of partners. So downstreet is one. Co-housing partners are another. Um, you know, different partnerships, different types of um, developers, who might have interest because one of the things in structuring the RFP, and we've got to do all a lot of this concurrently because we've got to push this zoning and the, the growth center designation forward diligently on the same path as the further due diligence permitting engineering track, as well as these partnerships, but start the conversations with those partners um, to gauge their interest and start to look for part, what about these plans do they like or not like that could potentially be attractive or not attractive that could help us frame out the RFP too to get at that answer and to start seeing the kind of results we want to see from that RFP. So I would say, you know, the who is a variety of partners. Um, we'd also, we're also probably not in the actual master plan itself, but one of the steps will be the city creates an RFP shortlist. You know, not shortlist, it's a long list. It's a list of the types of players you send the RFP out to not just blast it generally to you know paper, but rather seek out developers who've done some really innovative projects in this state, in New England, um, and try to get it in their hands, make sure they've seen it. So really be really strategic about getting out the RFP. So that's a who, that's a step. Um, and that's gonna happen over the next you know six to nine months of starting those partnerships. We're not gonna put it out to RFP that quickly, I don't think, because we have more due diligence and, and um, engineering to be done and then the subdivision plans, because we wouldn't go out to an RFP until we have a pretty clear delineation of where those parcels would be. Yeah, Lynn Seats, Montpelier. Um, I just have a question about the recreation part, and I see Arnie just walked out. Um, the road goes right through part of that 12 acres. So the way I look at it, it's down to maybe nine acres. And I, my question is, is that enough space for potentially in the facility fields, indoor and outdoor recreation? Because this, clearly there's going to be a lot of traffic on that road, and there's going to be a lot of kids outside. <laughs> I'm going to turn to Mike Z from Flatburger. I think the short answer is yes. Yes what? Yes, the road will go sort of generally through the middle, but there is room to do uh, excessive recreation on one side and partial recreation on the other. OK. Uh, so that 12 acres, I don't know. I just, has a road in the middle, I, 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 yes. Yeah, in the middle, yeah. So yeah. I think that's an overestimate of size. Of <coughs> that's all. I think it's a little misleading. Well, and I, I don't know, I mean, we also don't know if the existing building is going to be retained. I know. And, you know, so, you know, in terms of the orientation of the road, that could change too. So it may be. I think the other thing to consider is that the recreation site that big, you do need vehicular access to different points in it. You can't just have all the parking up front and have people walk you know, a mile and a half to get to wherever they're going. So um, some division of that area with vehicular traffic is to be expected and is not unusual. And you also have some parking in that zone too, which is not technically recreation, but it supports. No, I know that, and that's what I'm saying. So you really don't have 12 acres for recreation. That's all, it's, it's quite a bit smaller. Uh, Catherine Bacolis, Montpelier. Um, geothermal, can, when you're doing your infrastructure estimates, can you incorporate some of those? We can't. So. Generally? It's, or? it's really hard to do that estimating. We try, like, we kind of tried. Um, that has uh -huh. been, a, you know, an interesting and, um, uh, like, exciting prospect. And the modeling of that financing is really complicated because of the way it's done with a development partner um, and using not just the infrastructure itself, but also like, um, not user fees, what would you call it, Josh? Um, just the usage is factored into it. So it was too hard to calculate at this stage, but again, and that may not be a city investment, like it may be a city partnership with a developer to do geothermal. So that was one of the specific funding sources we didn't, there's a lot of different ways to slice it. So that's, I mean, that when I put that slide up, there's tons of different possibilities. There's grant funding that could be available for that type of technology. There's grant funding for um, mass timber. There's grant funding for all these different other technologies that those things are gonna have to come out in addition to 
um, in combination with the, with the developer themselves. Yeah. Further analysis that we had about the uh, feasibility of geothermal on the site. Right. We've had conversations, um, and, and we know that that is a, a technology that is not well known by developers in this state, and I know that they are trying to ramp up that component to, to educate them. So, more conversations about that to have. And the utilities themselves are getting involved, and that, you know, in two years, that technology is advancing. And there will be more, and there may be bigger partnerships with the utilities themselves to make that possible. So there's a lot of different ways that could come out in the financing. And we have about 15 to 20 minutes left for questions. Great, that. Uh, could you please define mass timber? Oh, sure. Mass timber is a technology that um, is emerging, used, used more and more. But I don't, Kate, you've been nodding. Do you know if it's been done in Vermont yet? There's a project right now that's right here. Is it? Okay. Okay. Um, you might be better at describing it than I will be. Do you, can you can you put it succinctly? I'm sorry. To put um, it's, you, it's using um, typically like lower grade timber smushed together, it, um, you know, uh, attached together into large panels. So um, to, to build either large large scale structures, um, typically it's used in in multi story buildings. In, in lieu of concrete and steel. Where does the timber come from? It can come from wherever. Right now, there's no uh, mass timber production facilities in New England, but they are. Um, there's actually someone in Northeast Kingdom that's working on developing something. There's some folks in Maine. So right now, it is actually it's hard to source the. Um, I can I can take that conversation offline and answer lots of questions about that but I don't know if it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's just an emerging technology and and construction methodology that brings down cost and is more sustainable as is using resources that are um, a lot more um, uh, have lower co fossil fuel impact and have a. Um, longer lifespan, have safe, high safety rating, mm -hmm. and we're trying to, uh, Vermont is try, has been trying to get some buildings done using this to prototype it so that it can be used in commercial um, standard applications. But right now it's being used at a lot of like public facilities, at least nationally I've seen, it's a lot of like welcome centers and some public facilities, um, and they're really trying to make it so that you can see how financially it works um, for, for mainstream uses as well. So there's some funding opportunities for that reason. It's really cool, but I'm saying it's just a possible, one of many possible technologies that might be used here. Thank you. Thanks again. Uh, Jeremy Beaudry, Montpelier. I was just at Fairbanks yesterday, and I've never seen anything like what they're doing. It's really cool. Check out. Um, I wanted to go back a couple points. Um, in the narrative, we often talk about kind of a monolithic developer, which is kind of scary when you think about single entity kind of controlling all this, but what I heard really was more about partnerships, multiple partners, um, you know, talk about downstream, maybe even the UVM Health Network, which is now building housing for employees. So I'm, I'm thinking about communication um, and really emphasizing that plural partnerships, part developers, um, with even examples, because I think that starts to bring in kind of more of the, the excitement of the possibility. So yeah, we've got downstream parking here. We've got other organizations that are focused on more afford affordability issues here, rather than kind of leading it to this kind of model, like market force. Yeah, um, yeah. Because that, that's a new thing that I haven't thought about. And it kind of gets me excited for actually what could occur. Sure, I mean, happen. Habitat could be a partner here. Um, yeah, help, that's helpful um, feedback. Capital, <coughs> capital B developer, Black Hat. Um, but the but the different partnerships because also it could be one developer and development company and development entity that does it it could be three different you know we don't know and that's the the exciting part because there's a lot of different opportunities there thank you uh, my name is Barney Abramowitz I'm a renter in Mount Gilead. Um in concept A based on your financing it seemed that there was a surplus of money over 20 years so wouldn't it make sense to increase the number of units, say, by 10%, 20%, to get the money quicker and use some of that money for the recreation development, <coughs> or to pay back the bond earlier, or to use it for future housing development elsewhere? There's actually two questions you have in there. <laughs> you may not have intended, but that's a good point. Um, so the 
the, the financing snapshot looks at everything over a 20 year period of gross and cash flow wise, that may look very different. It may be that, yeah, um, development takes a while to ramp up. And so you may have, you know, longer, it may take longer to pay it off. And if it happened faster, yeah, you could pay it off sooner. Um, and that's part of what we can't control relative to the market. So that would be something when it goes out to a developer, the speed at which they can do it is to be determined. That's not something we can necessarily control for. Um, the increase of units, though, is where we're at right now. Again, based on the process we had in the last um, four months, five months, is to say this is pretty much kind of the high, higher end of the density that was desired by the community. Um, and so, yes, by adding units, you could either increase your amount that could go toward um, uh, red, but then you're adding height. And adding height is something that, you know, the community, this was the scale the community at the max kind of said was desired. And I think Hi, uh, Dee Dee Brush again. Um, quick, so it's sort of been touched on a couple times. It sounds as though it's mo more than likely that there will be more than one developer. There may be nonprofits, et cetera, et cetera. My question is, who, who uh, maintains and controls each of these pods? Mm -hmm. If you've got three or four developers, mm -hmm. will there be any kind of uh, uniform expectations or, um, I'm trying to think of the right word. Like design. Des either design or maintenance or uh, uh, yeah. other issues that need to be thought of over the long haul. Yeah. Uh, because it's it's not the city yeah. who's developing these units. And it could be as many as, who sure. knows, two sure. or six developers. And I, I wonder how coherent it will be. So part of that's going to be zoning. Um, zoning, the zoning that gets put into place here will, you know, dictate some of that. Um, in a lot of ways, it's no different than creating a new neighborhood. I mean, you're creating a new part of town with a, um, a neighborhood vibe that may have different character to each section for different reasons and that may be perfectly valid. Um, so, the beginning of your question, I think, was, you know, how, how do we maintain that or, or, or guide it, I guess. And you know, there's development agreements that will have to be put into place between the city and the and the and the private entity or public private, whatever the public private quasi um, entity would be. And some of that could get baked in about restrictions. You could you could put in some restrictions if if the city is building the infrastructure and giving this you know pretty significant gift that could be that could be put in. But that's all to be determined, and it very much depends on again when, what is proposed. Because if one developer, we're not going to predict. We're just not going to predict that right now. Because one developer could come in and do the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And at some point, the developer leaves, and you've got just homeowners <laughs> associations that are left really sure. managing. Oh right. The, the okay, properties. thank you. Sure. You can tell I'm not a developer. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jess Obrowski. Um, I was just wondering, how did you get to the numbers of one bedroom units versus two bedroom units? I can't remember if that was part of the survey or not, but it seems like in all the proposals, there's more one bedrooms than, than two. Yeah. Well, there is, there has, there was an overwhelming um, response for um, multifamily and a lot of one bedrooms. Um, that was, I think, a big uh, comment back in the, in the feedback that we heard. And demographically, that tracks with a lot of what um, Montpelier's population is. But in terms of the mix, precisely, did, did you want to talk to the design? Uh, well, you know, certainly we have you know, single-family homes or one one family, and we we went and the increase I did. There's more two-bedroom units in the high in the five-story buildings as opposed to the duplexes and triplexes, which are more of a mix of ones and twos. Um, but you know, as kind of maybe the theme of today, all of that is really you know is flexible. Um, so before, but the, the assumptions that were made did factor into Stephanie's kind of model calculations, you know, for what the tax benefits are per unit. And we I had to make some assumptions. Yeah, Jess, a lot of that, um, you know, because right now the population of Montpelier may be one thing, and in five years it may be another thing, and the developer who comes in, I mean, they, again, lowercase D developer, someone who's got the best interest at heart of the community or has a sense of the community, does their due diligence. They have to figure out what's the demand. 
And so they're not going to put together a product that isn't in demand right now. They're going to put something out that um, the kind of partner that, that the city would pick would put something out there that is um, well vetted that's clearly in demand. Because there may be more of a demand in a few years for you know apartments that are suited for families of four or five people um, with uh, older relatives and so forth as these families, as we, get, we all get older and <laughs> we're, we're consolidating families a little bit. And you probably have this a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> but is, is there any reason that, that the recreation and community zone is 12 acres that is one piece as opposed to separating indoor and outdoor recreation and shrinking uh, the amount of infrastructure you need to go across the property um, and just creating more of a, you know, housing and the recreation facility on the front end of the property and the back end is outdoor recreation and maybe have a gravel road that goes to it. It doesn't mean, you know, a city street that needs to be paved in the winter because, you know, the only thing people are doing out there is cross country skiing. Right. A couple of features there and then I think Dave can speak more to it. One is that there's kind of outdoor rec built into the whole site though. You know, so we, well, we call it the recreation zone, you know, there's there's trails and fields and open natural area for, for everyone around it. But also thinking about um, bringing people that would be going for specific rec fields if they were in the back of this, trying to minimize how many cars are coming up through the site, through the housing neighborhoods to get to those has been part of it. A, that presumes that they're fields, right? People said outdoor right. recreation and you haven't defined Got what it. that is yet. Got it. Um, yes. yep. They just want to balance, right? I mean, yep. and right. nobody said, "Hey, I want soccer fields," and I'm not sure whether there's a shortage of soccer fields. But if there was, you know, could one be, you know? Yep. And because they're all the same flavor, really. I mean, it's you know, there's not an option that you could say, "Well, you know, I really prefer." To, and I don't know what it would do to the cost, too, because it would change that as well, because you wouldn't be building a road all the way across the property or water and sewer line all the way across the property. Well, in the survey from the winter, we went, um, it went node by node to talk about what, what, how to rank these nodes, and these nodes came back clearly for housing. So that was part of why that was done that way and not... I thought you certainly came back and it was like 7% conservation on a far, on a far pod. And it was the same for single family homes. So it was like, it, you know, there was, mo there was no more, you know, uh, there preference was to housing than there was, you know, to keeping it, you know, conserved. But in order to then also have, to, to meet the total amount of recreation needed, that, right. was, the, that was the trade off. And the unit counts too. And, yeah. and about, yeah, to meet the unit counts was why we got to that point. Staff, I'm curious, did you get input from the ever improving Montclair High School cross country team who now, you know, sprints up the hill, comes around, comes back around, and it's a tremendous course out here. Are you, are you working to, to keep that incorporated within the overall design at all? Has anybody given you input on that? Well, the trail, um, the trail network has also been vetted by the um, parks department for the city. Um, I don't know about how that dovetails with, this, yes, with the school. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When, you're, when you're looking at the plans and you see the recreational trails on there, like, we don't know if those are going to be the actual routes of the trails. So have, those have not been yet, like, designed, but they're there as, um, to just, as an illustration, uh, that there will be trails throughout. So, um, I, we have not talked to the cross country. I, think you I mean, every time we've been here for meetings this winter, there were races going on out here. Uh, you know. Gotcha. Ski. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about cross country running ski. or cross country I'm skiing? Cross -country skiing. Okay, great. So, yes, we've, we've definitely have talked to them before, and they have said that they didn't want to have roads on here because they didn't want their trails to go over <laughs> roads. So, I think, you know, in that context, what are we prioritizing? Yeah. A three month recreation activity over housing? Is an opportunity to work. I, I, think, I think the intention is to work with them, but I think the intention is to prioritize housing first, then a three month recreational activity. And there is. You know, um, I could just say that there have been little school cross country running races out here as well. Yes. It raises some of the same issues. It does strike me that good land use planning can incorporate ski trails as well as roads, and they don't necessarily have to cross. If you do your planning right, 
Right. Well, you know, you are aware of the U32 trail, right? That's going to be connected out there. Yeah, I know it's on the plan. Right. Well, that is a that is a project that's separate that is funded that will happen. Right. So. What kind of trail is that? Walking trail? It's a multi-use. Oh, multi-use. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, you know, I think there's a component here of collaboration that you know. The, while I say that the Rec and Community Zone. Uh, process is on this parallel path, it doesn't have to be exclusive. It's not exclusive, I would say, to that, only that node. I mean, it would look at the site comprehensively, too, um, and Parks is involved in that process as well, and that's to bring together all those elements, and um, talking with the schools is an important, that's an important stakeholder in that same process, so. Uh, we have time for like one more question before we wanna step outside and show you general orientation. Um, but further questions can all be directed to Josh after this um, or um, in the survey. Um, any follow-up, we'll post the slides online.